Okay, well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Walsh. I'm with the Central Pennsylvania MLK Day of Service, and we are honored to have you with us. Uh, this is actually the last session of the day. Uh, this session is attention renters know your rights. Um, and this has been a full day of online conversations and community engagement, making it a virtual day of service, uh, allowing people to join from all over the place from the safety of their own homes. And we're really happy that, uh, that so many did today. Uh, it's been really meaningful and we've been um, appreciative that so many people have made it a day on, not a day off. Um, so this year's theme is Neighbors Helping Neighbors. And a big part of the conversations that take place in our community have to do with food insecurity, with access to health care, and with housing insecurity. People facing uh, evictions, uh, the moratorium being a big discussion uh, in light of the economic downturn that is a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, at the forefront of this work is the uh, Fair Housing Council in, in Harrisburg. And we are really appreciative um, that Jim Zimmerman, uh, who does this work, uh, is with us today to discuss uh, the issues that are at the forefront uh, of uh, what renters are facing um, and to provide resources for folks who, uh, who might need them or might need to share them with others. Uh, one thing I wanted to note at the beginning, as I said just a couple of minutes ago before we got started, was this session is being recorded. So if you want to uh, take yourself off camera, you're welcome to do that. But just know that uh, this is a, a session that will be shared uh, on our website, uh, centralpamlkday.org. And uh, folks will have access to this. Uh, long after the day of service, because part of what we're doing is uh, engaging in conversations with people, and they, those conversations uh, begin on the day of service often, uh, but they continue uh, throughout the year. Uh, so uh, all of the sessions that we've had today uh, are uh, recorded and will be available online. Um, so we are appreciative that you're with us, uh, and we now want to uh, welcome Jim and we'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Michael. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello? We can hear you. I, I could hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, I'm not uh, I'm not real familiar with Zoom. I'm, I'm an old guy and I prefer the face-to-face -face contact uh, as opposed to this new technology, but uh, I'm getting a little used to it and uh, I hope you all can hear me and I hope everyone's having a nice day. Uh, I am a housing counselor with the Fair Housing Council of the Capital Region, which is located at uh, 6th and McClay Street in Uptown Harrisburg. Uh, the, th the council was founded in 1974, and one of the first services that we offered to people in the community was what we call a landlord-tenant helpline, which is a, simply a telephone line where folks that have questions about landlord tenant rights and responsibilities can call us and we can give them information about what their rights and responsibilities are. This service is, opera, is offered to both landlords and tenants, although the vast majority of calls that come in are from tenants. So we've been doing this for a long time, since the 1970s uh, with our landlord tenant helpline. We also uh, uh, if we need to, and people call our helpline, we oftentimes have them come in the office to read a lease or anything else that needs face-to-face -face contact. So uh, it's not the only service that the Fair Housing Council offers. I've been there since 1989. So I've been there for oh, 30 years. And uh, I was hired 
asked by Mel Johnson. I don't know if you know that name, but he was one of the founders of the Fair Housing Council. Uh, a, a very, very knowledgeable and very persuasive man who, who guided us through all these years. Unfortunately, Mel passed away uh, in 2020, as did his daughter, Beverly, who was a counselor with our office. So we've had a big losses in addition to the coronavirus, our agency has suffered some big losses in 2020. Uh, but anyway, I got to know Mel very well over those years and he hired me as someone who would take over our, for the first time, would offer and take over our home ownership counseling. So that's what I was hired for in 1989. And, uh, and we've done that since 1989 too, another program. We have a eight hour class that we deliver every month. And it goes through all the ins and outs of buying your firm. And it has been expanded over the years and we have had thousands of people who graduated from that class who have gone on to become homeowners. The class is designed to help people know all the ins and outs of buying your first home so that you make the best possible decision for yourself when you go through that process. So our goal here is to have people that are not only home buyers, but that are educated home buyers and successful home buyers. That's the goal of the workshop. In addition to the workshop, we also do individual credit counseling with people where people can come in and sit down and meet with us. We help them establish a budget. We pull a credit report, review that with them. We give them specific recommendations to help them get to the point where they can walk into a bank and get a mortgage. Now, I mentioned all this about home ownership. I do that and I also have manned the landlord tenant helpline over the years too. But home, home ownership is, is a goal for a lot of Americans and a noble goal. And, and uh, it's one of, I've, I've had many people come up to me over the years and say, I want to get out of this renting situation. I'm giving my money to my landlord. Sure, he's providing a roof over my head, but, but uh, I'm not getting thing, anything out of it. Whereas with home ownership, there's a lot of advantages to it. So uh, we, we do that as an alternative to uh, renting and we help people get to the point where they can buy their first home. That workshop is aimed at first time home buyers and is given every month of the year except December. Okay, back to landlord tenant rights and responsibilities. There are a number of places where you have rights and responsibilities. And I'm gonna kind of view this from the tenant side. But, the first place where your rights and responsibilities are, are in your lease. Uh, you need to carefully read your lease when you're looking to rent a, a home. You need to very carefully read it to see what the term of the lease is, how long it lasts. Uh, can the landlord end it during that term? Uh, what are my rights under the lease? Uh, what utilities do I have to pay for? What utilities does the landlord provide? And, and that release needs to be read very carefully. And one of the things we do is if someone has a problem with their lease or doesn't understand the wording or it's written in legalese, we help them, we, we sit down with them and go over their lease with them and tell them what their, again, what their rights and responsibilities are under the lease. The other thing we encourage tenants to do when they first move in, in addition to reading your lease very carefully is to do what's called a uh, move in, move out checklist. And what that is, is, and we have a form for that in our office, but it's easy to create. When you move in, you just note the things in each room that are deficient. So the landlord of those deficiencies, so he has uh, notice to correct them. And we always recommend that when you're notifying the landlord of any defects or any repairs that need to be done, that you do that in writing. Document it, it's very important. Document, document, document. Uh, it's okay to just call the landlord and say, hey, uh, my faucet's leaking, can you send the plumber out to fix it? That's well and good, but you should always follow that up with a letter saying, 
I spoke to you on the phone today. Uh, I, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to come out to fix it, you know, just as a, as a follow-up. So move in, move out checklist. That way you protect your security deposit. Most landlords require a security deposit to, uh, to uh, move into the rental property. And uh, I'll go over the rules on security deposits in a little while too, but a security deposit is basically a hedge against the tenant damaging the property. And uh, uh, usually the most common security deposit in Pennsylvania is one month rent, but it can be different than that. Again, I'll go over that in a little bit. But back to the move in, move out checklist, this kind of guarantees that when you move out that, and you fill out the move out part of the checklist, that you leave the property in the same or better condition than it was when you first rented it. So there is no, uh, there's no excuse for the landlord to take money from your security deposit for any damages that you might cause. Uh, so do a move in, move out checklist. Take a video of, of the property uh, showing any defects. Uh, take pictures if you don't have a video recorder. All these kind of things protect you as a tenant. Now, let's move on to security deposits. Mike, how are you dealing with questions here? Do you want me to just continue to roll or do you, do you have questions that I should answer along the way or what's going on with that? Uh, we invite everyone to uh, wait till the end to ask a question uh, on audio. If they have questions and they wanna put them in the chat box, uh, they can do that and, and, uh, and we'll ask them. We'll wait till the end and then ask all the questions unless you see one that pop well, up that you wanna okay. answer. And, and just just so just so I can time myself, when is the end? Yeah, is so it four o'clock. It's four o'clock. Yeah, yeah. So okay, okay. So may, maybe I'll try to uh, run no later than like a quarter of, so there's room for any questions that might sure, pop up. That's fine. Okay. Now, w one thing I always tell tenants that call in on our helpline, there is an excellent website put out by the Pennsylvania Legal Services Corporation that goes over landlord tenant rights and responsibilities. Excellent, excellent website. It's called palawhelp.org. PA for Pennsylvania, law, L-A-W, help, H-E-L-P, dot org. Uh, that, that website, if you go on the homepage and click housing and shelter, it has about a dozen topics and most of them are landlord tenant related. You have a topic of uh, evictions, you have a topic of security deposits, you have a topic of utilities, uh, you have a topic of uh, your right to a safe home, which covers the landlord's responsibility for repairs. Just a, a really good website to inform tenants and landlords, but more tenants, but uh, of, of your rights and responsibilities under the Pennsylvania landlord tenant law, which is when we're talking about rights and responsibilities, I mentioned your lease is, is important. That defines rights and responsibilities. And leases can differ from landlord to landlord. Uh, uh, there is a plain language law in Pennsylvania that requires leases to be written in languages, in, in language that people can understand and not in so much legalese. And it bans words such as lessee and lessor and, and instead tells you to use words like tenant and landlord. So uh, there is a plain language law that requires leases to be written in plain language that people can understand. Despite that, that law, I still see leases occasionally that people bring to me that are, that are just outright violate that plain language law. And I usually inform the landlord, look, you need to bring your lease in compliance with the uh, plain language law. Okay, so your lease is one important source of your rights and responsibilities. And again, if, if you have questions or don't understand some of the wording in your lease, there, are, there is help out there. Uh, we are a HUD approved housing counseling agency. We serve the central Pennsylvania area, but there are close to a hundred agencies like us scattered throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Most of them do landlord tenant counseling in their area just as we do landlord tenant counseling in the central Pennsylvania area. Now, all right, so you have your lease, then you have your state landlord tenant law, which is outlined in that PA law help website. And I'll go over some of the things that are covered under that, under that website. 
let's talk about security deposits. There are several rules regarding security deposits. First of all, during your first year of occupancy in any rental unit, the landlord can charge up to two months rent as a security deposit, up to two months rent. That means if you have a, uh, if your rent is $750 for the first year you live in a property, the landlord can legally charge you $1,500 as a security deposit. So most landlords do not do that. They charge just one month's rent, but they can for the first year charge up to two months rent. After the first year, the landlord can cha charge no more than one month's rent as a security deposit. So if the landlord hits you up for two months rent as a security deposit when you move in and you live there longer than the year, that landlord is obligated to refund one of those two months to you. And I have seen numerous instances where people have lived in properties for more than a year and the landlord never refunds that, uh, charges them two months rent at the beginning and never refunds the, the one month part of it, even though they're legally obligated to do that under the landlord tenant law. Now, the other thing, thing is after two years in the same rental unit, the landlord is required to put your security deposit into an interest bearing account and pay interest on that on an annual basis. And the interest rate, of course, fluctuates over the over the years, but uh, uh, you have to come up with a reasonable amount of what the uh, interest rate is that banks charge for the, that period of time. But landlords are, are required, again, under the state landlord tenant law, to put your money in an interest bearing account, notify you in writing where the funds are being held and pay you interest on an annual basis. And then after five years, the landlord cannot raise your security deposit even if the rent goes up. So that's kind of a synopsis of the uh, uh, rules regarding security deposits. We always tell tenants, again, back to your move in, move out checklist. When you move out, request that the landlord do a move out expect, uh, move out inspection with you. Uh, you and the landlord, the day you give them the keys, you, you go through the property with the landlord. Uh, maybe you have your lease in front of you. And if there's any uh, uh, damages, maybe ask the landlord, let's write a statement at the end of this lease. that says there are no visible damages which would affect tenant security deposit. Both people initial that. So you're again, protecting yourself to get back your security security deposits. So we, we do recommend that you do a walkthrough inspection. Some landlords will do that, some won't. But if they don't, then you have your moving out checklist, you have your video, you have your pictures, that sort of thing. So that if they try to keep your security deposit or part of it that you don't think they should keep, then you'll have to file with the district justice to recover. And you'll have to convince the district justice that you should have gotten back your security deposit. There's where your move in, move out checklist, pictures and videos can help you prove your point. So that, that's kind of the rules regarding security deposits. Uh, let's talk about uh, repairs. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case in Pennsylvania, and I think the, the name of the case was Evans versus Pew, but it happened, uh, oh, quite a while ago in the 1950s. And that Supreme Court decision made the landlord responsible to provide a safe, habitable place for the tenant to live. And it also, that decision listed certain things that make it not a safe, habitable place to live. No heat in the key roof, these kind of things. So the landlord is under the obligation, again, under the landlord tenant law in Pennsylvania, which was enacted in 1951 and amended many times since then, but the landlord is under the obligation to provide a safe, habitable place to live. If the landlord fails in this responsibility, the tenant has a number of options. The tenant, first of all, particularly if you're in the city of Harrisburg, the city has a uh, housing code department that will inspect the rental property. You file a landlord tenant complaint with the city housing codes off. They will come out and inspect the property. They will issue a written report with any code violations and the landlord is given a deadline to fix that. I think the enforcement of this uh, city code ordinance has been 
a little spotty in the past. Uh, there was a time in Harrisburg back in the 1990s when Harrisburg had a, a uh, rental, uh, trying to think of the name of it. It was an ordinance where you could, you could, if the inspection indicated 20 or more points against the property, you could go into the city and put your rent money in escrow with the city who would then use the rent money to do the needed repairs. That's no longer in, in existence, but that, I thought that was a really good program that, that, that went out of existence, but uh, it, it, it allowed the tenants, if the property was in pretty bad condition, to uh, escrow the rent. Again, that, that's no longer with us. So what do we have now? You still get your city code inspection and you have a written report and you have the, the uh, inspector to testify for you if you need his testimony, uh, if the property is not a safe habitable place to live. Now, uh, so the landlord or the tenant has the right to get a code inspection. Tenant also has the right, if, if there are numerous repairs that need to be done, the tenant has the right to escrow the rent money. Now, the, the, ne the next question is, how much money do you escrow? If it's in really bad condition, really bad condition, the law allows you to escrow the entire amount of the rent. And how you escrow is you go to your bank, you as a tenant, you go to your bank, you open up a separate account, savings account, you put your rent money in that account and you write the letter saying, to the landlord saying you're escrowing your rent because he has not provided you with a safe habitable place to live and you list the repairs that need to be done okay so you're putting the landlord on notice that he's not getting his rent money until he fixes things in the property and brings it up to code okay so you you escrow the rent now if it's just something uh like like if you have a three-bedroom apartment and maybe one of the bedrooms is not usable because the ceiling leaks in that bedroom. And the rest of the apartment is, is okay in good condition. Maybe you escrow a third or a two thirds, excuse me, a third of the rent money because one of the three bedrooms, in other words, if you're paying 750, you may escrow 250 of the rent money because one of the bedrooms isn't, uh, isn't uh, satisfactory. So important thing for a tenant to do when they decide to escrow is to figure out how much they want to escrow, uh, either part of the rent or all the rent, depending on the condition of the property. Now, the, the tenant has the right to also, for smaller repairs, to do what the law calls repair and deduct. You ask the landlord to fix something, he doesn't do it within a reasonable period of time. You write the landlord, you write him a second letter, he still doesn't do it, and a reasonable period of time has elapsed you have the right to go out there and hire someone uh, to do the repair, pay them and deduct whatever you pay for the rent. And I've seen that happen on, in situations where like the landlord provides a refrigerator and the refrigerator uh, stops working and the tenant asks the landlord to either fix it or replace it. And the tenant and the landlord doesn't do that. The tenant goes out and either gets a repairman to fix the refrigerator or buys a new comparable refrigerator and deducts it from the rent money. That's, that's a, a right you have under the landlord tenant law. Now, the caution with those two rights, the rent escrow and the repair and deduct, the caution with that is that the landlord oftentimes will take the landlord to a district justice court to evict them for non-payment of rent. And in that case, the tenant has to convince the district justice that it's not a safe, habitable place to live, or the landlord hasn't done the repairs in a reasonable period of time. And I'll tell you, over the years, that's a hard sell, particularly in Dauphin County. I'm most familiar with the district justices in Dauphin County. And uh, district justices, and, and I hesitate to say this, but uh, district justices are more landlord friendly than they are tenant friendly in Dauphin County. I don't know if that holds true for the rest of Pennsylvania, but uh, uh, a lot of times you do not get a fair shake in front of a district justice. So you need to have your ducks in order when you uh, do those kind of things, uh, escrow rent or repair and deduct. Another right you have is to take the landlord to court to recover 
the rent that you paid during the time the repairs weren't done, and maybe to sue them for the cost of repairs. So you have the right to do that. You can initiate a legal proceeding against the landlord. Or you can simply terminate the lease if you're in the middle of a year long lease, six months into it. He's not done these repairs despite your new finding a better place to live. Again, you should document that because again, the landlord may take you to court to try to recover a penalty for you terminating the lease early. So those are some of the rights that tenants have if the landlord doesn't provide a safe, habitable place to live. And ultimately, if the landlord contests the tenant doing these things, ultimately it's up to a district justice to decide. That's why it's very important to document, document, document. So that's a little review of safe, habitable place to live. Uh, let's talk about evictions. And uh, uh, we do have the CDC moratorium in effect right now, but I don't know if other people today have mentioned this or not, but that only covers evictions that are filed for non-payment of rent. Uh, it does not cover evictions for, there are three reasons for eviction under the law in Pennsylvania. One is that your lease is over. Two is that you breach some condition of the lease. And that could be one of a hundred different things. It could be you, uh, the, your lease has a no pet policy and you have a pet. It could be that you got caught selling drugs on the property and uh, got arrested for that. Uh, it, you know, it could be a multitude of sins. It could be you move somebody else in that wasn't on the lease without the landlord's consent. So those are things that we call breach of lease. So you have breach of lease, you have uh, end of lease, and you have non-payment of rent. So the moratorium covers end of lease, or excuse me, moratorium covers non-payment of rent. It does not cover end of lease or breach of lease. So a lot of landlords are trying to evict tenants for like the lease is over. And you got to remember with a month to month lease, if you have a month to month lease, your lease is over on the end on the last day of every month. So the law only, if you want to end, if the landlord wants to terminate the lease because your lease is over and you have a month to month lease, the landlord, according to the landlord tenant law has to only give you a 15 day notice to vacate. And if you don't vacate, they could take you to a district justice and that CDC moratorium doesn't cover that particular, that particular reason to evict, nor does it cover breach of lease. And a lot of landlords during this pandemic have tried to evict tenants for what I consider petty uh, breach of lease issues. And so you still have those issues where a landlord can legally evict a tenant and not have to follow the CDC guidelines. It's the CDC guidelines of income, which caused them to fail to, to pay the rent in a timely manner. And the, the, the first round of this restrictions, the, the, the paperwork was so cumbersome that they relieved the tenant of some of the responsibility and allowed the tenant to self-certify that, uh, that they got behind because of the coronavirus. So uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why the program wasn't used widely throughout Pennsylvania during that first round. Hopefully uh, it'll be used more as we move along and, and hopefully uh, it will be extended. So you have those three reasons for evictions and the steps that a landlord must have to follow to evict someone is first to give them a notice to quit. And that notice to quit, again, should be part of your lease. Uh, a lot of leases will say uh, the landlord must give the tenant a 10 day notice before filing with the district justice. Some leases will require the landlord to give a 30 day notice. There are leases out there where the landlord doesn't have to give any notice at all. The tenant in the lease waives their right to a written, written notice, which means the landlord can start immediately with step number two, which is to file the district justice. But normally the procedure is a written notice which has to be hand delivered to the tenant or posted on the door. A written notice to vacate the date the landlord wants, wants them out of there and the reason they're asking them to leave. That's what should be on a notice to vacate. So you get your notice to vacate, uh, 15 days expire, the tenant is still there, the landlord must file with the district justice. The law requires a hearing within seven to 15 days. 
of the date the landlord files the uh, the complaint. And uh, the district justice at the hearing, uh, in, in an ideal situation, hears both sides of the story, although I've had a lot of tenants tell me the, the district justice listened to the landlord side of the story and, and not the, their side, the tenant side of the story. And it's just too many people have expressed this for me to know that that's that is happening out there. That 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 that's that's fact. So the district justice ideally hears both sides of the story and uh, uh, makes his decision. And the, 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 there are two components to the district justice decision. Number one, how much money is owed? How much money does the tenant owe the landlord? And that's usually in the form of background or and late fees, that sort of thing. But it could be the reverse of that if the district justice rules in favor of the tenant. Uh, not usually, but it could be. Uh, but that's the first decision, how much money the, the, the landlord owes the tenant. And the second decision is whether the landlord has uh, whether the landlord has grounds for eviction, whether they can put the tenant out of the house. So there's two things. Now, uh, on the form that the district justice sends out to both landlords and tenants, and I've had a lot of tenants over the years tell me they never got they never got this form. Uh, some even said the landlord comes to my mailbox and takes my mail, so I never got the decision from the district justice. So I see that see that happen too. But the the, the form is called a notice of judgment slash transcript, and it basically tells what the district justice decides. Here's how much money you tenant you Mr. Tenant owe you you Mr. Landlord, and uh, uh, whether they're given the landlord possession of the property or not. Now. If the ruling is against the tenant, the tenant has 10 days to appeal the eviction to the next higher court, which in Dauphin County is the Court of Common Pleas. And um, uh, there's a whole procedure. It's a complicated procedure to file an appeal. Uh, we can help with that. Legal Services does a lot of that too. Uh, Mid-Pen Legal Services helps tenants file an appeal if the tenant disagrees with the district justice decision. So if you're not protected by the CDC moratorium and you disagree with the district justice decision to stop the eviction, you got to file an appeal within 10 days. If you don't care about staying in the property and plan on leaving, but disagree with the amount the district justice rule is owed, you have 30 days to file that appeal. That doesn't stop the eviction, but it, it you're appealing the money judgment. So 10 days to appeal, the possession of the property, 30 days to appeal the money judgment. Okay, uh, I've, I, it looks like I've ran over my time a little bit here. It's uh, about uh, five, 10 minutes till four. So uh, I, I pretty much covered a, a bunch of stuff. If anybody has any questions or, or uh, questions, there's other things that, uh, that, are, uh, that I, run across every day. I run across the landlord's right to enter the property and how much notice he must give and stuff like that. Those are all important things. Again, you can find the answers to that in the PA Law Help website. And everything that I've covered today can be found under that PA Law Help website. It's an excellent source of information on landlord tenant rights and responsibilities. Uh, okay, so uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mike, it looks like there's a lot of stuff in the chat box. Is that, yeah, so there, is that uh, for me? Well, Erica uh, wrote a number of comments uh, discussing her particular situation, uh, Erica Blanton. Um, it seems to me that maybe Erica would be uh, helped by a offline conversation perhaps with you, Jim. Uh, she went through a number of comments and things she's done in the past. Sure. That way um, I don't know if you could want to provide sure. a phone number or some or an email someplace Erica could get a hold of you after today for more detailed discussion. Tell Erica to email me at jzimmerman 
my middle, my first initial J for Jim Zimmerman at pafairhousing.org. Did you get that? J Zimmerman at PA for Pennsylvania fairhousing.org. Dot org. Mm -hmm. PA fairhousing.org. J Zimmerman at PA fairhousing.org. Put that in the uh, chat box for everybody. So Erica could Great. through some of the specifics. Any other question? Any questions? And, 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 if, and if she if she emails me with her phone number, I'll be glad to call her and discuss her Perfect. situation with her. Um, I, I'm a part-time employee too. I, I work usually two or three days a week, but uh, I'll try to yeah. answer everybody's questions as soon as possible. I'm sure you put in your time, Jim, and even work more than two to three days a week doing the good work you do. Well, I, I used to put in about 60 hours a week with the Fair Housing Council, but uh, I'm an old guy. I'm 76, so I've cut down, cut down my hours considerably. Good for you. Okay, other, uh, any questions or thoughts or comments? Uh, this has been really helpful, I appreciate it. Um, anybody else have questions or thoughts or comments? Can you think of anything, Mike, that I might not have covered that uh, the rest of the uh, audience would be interested in? Nothing comes to mind, Jim. I think you were um, okay. pretty detailed and exhaustive in your discussion. I think it, it went through a um, number of the key points, uh, You know, the, the moratorium and what is in and what is out, what are the reasons for eviction? We covered uh, the plain language law and knowing what's in your lease. Um, knowing what a landlord can keep and what he can hold back as regards to security deposit. I mean, I think this has been really helpful, really great information. And you provided us with, an, um, you know, with obviously a number of links, um, including palawhelp.com. So you've given us the tools today. Uh, .org, palawhelp. palawhelp.org, thank you. palawhelp.org. I did put that in chat too. Okay. Okay. I'll be quiet for a minute and just see if anybody else has any questions before we adjourn. Right before we okay. leave, Jim, I just wanted to mention uh, that workshop that you had talked about for new homeowners, the class. Yes. Um, I worked at Messiah University uh, uh -huh. years ago and we brought that class to graduating seniors. So they actually went through it to learn how to become new homeowners. So it was very thankful for that resource for those students that were about ready to exit higher education and, and get into the community. So thanks for that. I would just like You're to welcome. add that By the way, speaking speaking of education speaking of edu education, uh, and and uh, you mentioned you work for Messiah and that information was given to college students. I I think at the high school level, we need courses for the students there in budgeting and uh, credit, how to read a credit report, stuff like this, because that's going to affect you for the rest of your life. That needs to, uh, we, we, we don't do that enough in the schools. And I think the high schools is the place to do that, even, even maybe even in the junior high schools. But I think that's important information that affects people's lives and they need to know that stuff early on. On the subject of landlord and tenant, this is Rhonda uh, of Fair Housing. Um, I just wanted to point out that we get a lot of questions um, from people that, uh, and, and requests for assistance from people who live in rooming houses, boarding houses, the weekly um, rentals, and also um, people that live in mobile home housing and, and are residing in campgrounds kind of um, all year round. Um, I don't think that Jim has enough time to get into the, um, the rights and responsibilities of people who live in those, um, under those home um, conditions, um, under those circumstances, but the Fair Housing Council um, would be able to assist people in, in almost any kind of uh, rental housing position that they find themselves in right now, um, just so that you're everyone is aware that, you know, laws and um, 
uh, you know, different rights and responsibilities and the way that the system works is different in many ways for people that live in a weekly um, rental or in some other kind of rental um, situation than just apartments. You know. um, you know, please reach out to us if you have any questions about uh, any kinds of housing arrangements that you might find yourself in. Um, and also, if you're living in someone's house, like your parents' house, um, you know, there's a hundred different living arrangements in the city and um, and each different kind of arrangement um, has a different, um, you know, the level of uh, legal answers or not legal answers, but guidance that we can give to people. So reach out to us. Um, no matter what kind of housing situation that you find yourself in. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you for that information. Uh, any other final uh, thoughts or questions? Okay. Well, this is uh, the concluding event of our 11th annual day of service. Uh, we thank you, Jim, and we thank you, Rhonda, for joining us, uh, for sharing this information. As mentioned, this will be recorded and will be shared again in the future. So uh, we, have, we uh, know many people will benefit from this. And uh, we thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we uh, invite you to leave a reaction, uh, a thumbs up, a heart, uh, let us know what you thought. And uh, we appreciate uh, that you were part of this, this day of service. Uh, what we're doing next is we're going to um, Facebook Live for uh, some concluding remarks to the day of service. Um, so if you're on Facebook and social media, you can join us there. And uh, we'll look for you there. I can. All right. So, All right. Thanks, everybody. I can.